Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be together. I want to uh, extend a warm welcome to all of those who are visiting with us today and to you who are online. We uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, hopefully you'll find, uh, have found our worship to be uplifting and encouraging. It's always great to come together and, and to hear the voices of, uh, of God's people lifting praise. Just a, a very, uh, very beautiful thing. And uh, today, I wanted to uh, just talk a little bit about uh, life lessons from fatherhood. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a different message. Uh, and so, yeah, you'll, you'll see what I mean here in just a moment. But, I, I, you know, I was looking at a few thoughts here from um, comments that people have made about dads. Okay, so I just w wanted to read these just some thoughtful insights here. Um, Four-year-old asked their father, Hey, Dad, will you tell me a scary story? Father says, um, One time, little people popped out of your mom and never stopped asking questions. <laughs> and the four-year-old said, Why? <laughs> okay. Uh, this is uh, another comment I thought was, uh, was very insightful here. But it says... Um, even though my dad, I'm proud of my dad that he invented the rear view mirror, we're not as close as we appear. <laughs> Have to think about that one there for a moment. Okay. All right. Yeah. You can tell the best years of the father's life because it seems like he froze that period of clothing and he's going to ride it out to the end. <laughs> right? All right. Don't be looking around at your dads now. Okay. I know. Mark Twain said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand the old man. But at the age of 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in the past seven years. <laughs> um, having children is like a frat house. Nobody sleeps, everything's broken, and there's a lot of throwing up. That was... That was interesting. Okay. Last one from George W. George W. made the comment. He said, um, I've been to war. I've raised twins. If I had a choice, I'd rather go to war. Okay. So there you go. Just, uh, just some thoughts on fatherhood. Uh, you know, it's great. It is great to come together to celebrate and, uh, you know, to think about uh, just how blessed we really are. I think this is a theme that we feel over and over, that God has really blessed our lives in, in tremendous ways. And we certainly know that in our society, as the family decays, uh, our, our society worsens. And yet, you know, there's always hope. There's hope that there will be men and women who will stand for what is right and, and men who will be fathers, who will stand and help their wife and their children uh, and help each other to be able to uh, journey to heaven. And so today, I want to look at a couple of fathers uh, and... I don't know why exactly. Uh, sometimes when I'm preparing a message, I, I, something will come to my mind and I feel like it just it, it flashes sometimes like a neon sign in my mind. Um, and so when I thought about this Father's Day message and, and I wanted to do a message that that are life lessons we can all learn. So this is not we're, we're going to look at a couple of dads, uh, a couple of fathers but these are lessons that we can all learn and apply in our lives and in our families and etc. Uh, because I think, you know, this is a very, very important thing. Uh, I was watching, I, I know, um, I, um, I like to watch crime shows. Okay, I know, I know my kids are shocked. I have two of them here today. I'm sure they're really shocked that I do. That was a joke. Um, and I noticed they were having... Uh, on one of the channels, it was called Bad Dad Week. Okay, so the whole week was all about bad fathers, okay? And so I wouldn't call this a continuation necessarily, but the dads that we're going to look at today were not what we would call stellar role models. And uh, one of the things that I appreciate about the Word of God is that you know, the Bible, if the Bible were written by men, we would never read about some of the things that we're going to read about right now. Because God wants you and I to see honestly how he relates to us as real people. We're not 
we're not here for churchianity. We're not here to paste on some sort of a fake religion. God wants to relate to his people, and he relates to us with all of the flaws that we may carry. He loves us, and he, he's with us. And so, you know, today we're going to look at some dads and, and try to look at a few lessons here uh, as we go through. Uh, the first father I want to look at, his name is Eli. Now, I hope that today you'll write some of these passages down, and you'll go back and look at them, because time does not permit us today to go through the entire dialogue that surrounds these two incidences that we're going to talk about. But, but if you can get motivated enough to go back and study, you will learn far more than we will talk about here this morning. But, but this first example of Eli and his sons, I think, is a, it's a very sobering one. So I'm telling you, right out of the gate, this is going to get pretty intense. But Eli, uh, if, we, if we can look at our text here, um, let's see, do we have it up the... Uh, uh, the text is from 1 Samuel chapter 3. And uh, it says here, the Lord speaking to Samuel. A third time, the Lord said to Samuel, Samuel got up, he went to Eli. Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. And so, as Samuel responded, Lord, I'm here. Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, see... I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears about it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons blasphemed God, and he failed to restrain them. Therefore, I swore to the house of Eli... The guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or other offering. And so the verse here that I want to look at is interesting because, you know, the Lord had made a promise to Eli that he would, he would have a line in the priesthood forever. But God changed his mind and removed him and removed all future generations from the priesthood because of this simple thing. In verse 13, For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about, and he failed to restrain them. Now, here's a good lesson for dads right here. You, when, we know, when we know things are wrong in the family, the dads need to be the one to get up and do something about it. Not think that, oh, well, I'm, I'm not here most of the time. I'm going to hand it over to mom. Dads, we need to lead our families. And so here we find, though, that the, the lesson that I think speaks to us, these life lessons, is this. If we know something is wrong, we need to speak up. Okay? And I think this is very important because we, we, we are in a society where we are being overwhelmed with worldliness. We're being overwhelmed by principles of evil. And if it isn't, if we do not stand up and speak out for what is right, we merely get carried along with the culture. And today, we're hesitant because we are bullied often by society, and we're bullied by our friends, and we're bullied by our, our job requirements, that we are afraid to speak up when we know something is wrong. And today, I hope we'll all be set free because when we know something's wrong, we should speak up and say something about it. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, this is a challenge for all of us. It's a challenge for all of us. But, but you know, it's amazing what one voice, just one voice can, can do in stemming a tidal wave of evil if one voice will but speak up and say, this is something I don't agree with. A couple of examples of this that I, I wanted to uh, share. You know, um, this week I was reading uh, in the Christian Post uh, about a lawsuit that is being filed. There was a woman in the Midwest. She was in a graduate program, and she was there, and she is a devoted Christian, and she was sharing her, her views on different things. The class was supposed to be a, an art theory discussion-type class, and she was sharing in a very thoughtful manner 
and, but three of the students didn't like what she was doing, so they emailed the dean, and immediately this woman is put on disciplinary action and, and told she cannot speak to the following students, and there was a list. There were emails going around about her to the entire class, 13 different uh, emails going around telling that we're investigating her, she's harassing, et cetera, et cetera. And she became the subject, the subject of persecution simply because in a graduate program at a state university where in the exact same class they had discussed witchcraft and tarot cards, and, and went through them thoroughly, here's a, a woman, a young woman, who wants to speak up and respectfully disagree, and she is marked and disciplined. And I'm saying, this is the kind of stuff we need to speak up about. Now, I'm thankful to say that she has recruited someone, and they are filing a lawsuit against the university. And by the way, it's very interesting that a couple of days after the lawsuit was filed, all of the no-contact orders were rescinded. Isn't that interesting? These kind of things go on around us, and, and we're not there. We, we, we can't physically do anything about it, but we can pray about it, and we can speak up about it. Because these are the kind of things that we're just, we get numb to them. They're going on all the time. Good is being stomped out. Truth is trying to be smothered. And we, if we are passive, we will just get covered with this and will not be able to make a difference. One voice can make a difference. And I hope that if we know something's wrong, that we're going to speak up. You know, I was reminded in, in preparing, I was reminded of a, when I first went into the ministry. First time I took a full-time preaching job was in a small town in Wisconsin. And uh, Wisconsin. And I, w I was there, and, you know, it was a whole new thing. I, I was the first small town I'd ever lived in, and uh, it was a beautiful place, great people, great people in the church, etc. And I was, all of, I was all of 24 at that time. That was about five years ago. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, I was all of 24 at that time. There was a whole lot about ministry I didn't know, and there's still a whole lot I don't know. But I know one thing. I, I was... One day after church, a woman approached me, and she said, Tim, I, I want to talk to you about something. A a and I could tell her hesitancy and, and her emotion. And she, had, she was newly baptized, a member of our congregation. She said to me, Tim, she said, I I'm in a situation at home where I don't know what to do. I said, well, wh what do you mean? She said, well, when I go home in the evenings... My husband, he beats me. And he not only beats me, but he gets me down on the ground every night and takes a loaded pistol and puts it in my mouth and threatens to kill me. She said, what, what do you think I should do? Now, I want to say something before I say what I'm about to say. She had already been told by another minister and her husband's minister that her duty was to go home and submit to her husband. She had already been told that. I didn't know that at the time. And she said to me, Tim, what do you think I should do? Well, I said, uh, well, number one, I would call the police immediately and report him. I would get a restraining order filed against him. I would go home for tonight and I would pack my things, take those kids, and I would get out of that house. And you know what? She did that. And do you know what? The police came. And do you know what? Not only that, it, it was just amazing how in this turmoil, I, I, I went and met with him. Because he had said, he had seen such a change in his wife and he hated what he saw because what she was doing was good. She had repented of her sin and he hated it because it was speaking to him. It made his evil even more dark. But she would not back down. 
She was told by friends, I'm sure he'll straighten up. Go ahead. Go ahead. I told her, don't go. Don't go. Don't go. And I, I just was astounded that someone would ever counsel a person in that situation to go back into that situation. In the name of Jesus, of all things. How sad and pathetic that we would send any human being back into a knowing, abusive situation. But you know something? Because she spoke up, finally. She had the courage to speak up and say something about it because she was able to do that. She was able to get her whole household changed around. And I will tell you, her husband was baptized into Christ and he was a dedicated disciple. Because God does wonders. But you know what? As long as evil is kept in the dark, Satan just keeps on and on and on. And I, I want to say today, we have to be in situations where we're, not, where we're not afraid to speak up. If something's going on, I was so appreciative that, that, that she spoke up to me and, and that we were able to get something to happen so that God could work in a powerful way. Sometimes the Lord's just waiting to work for one person to speak up and say something. Um, in our personal conversations in our family, I think this is where it's got to start. You know, there are times we know things are not going well in our family. And that we, we should speak up. Have you ever noticed things don't go away in your family? You wish they would go away. You don't like the situation, but nobody's saying anything about it. And so it just keeps revolving and revolving and revolving. And there are times in the best of families. There are times in the very best of families. There are times in, 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 in good marriages where things have to get talked out. That's not a weakness. That's a strength. To be able to have the humility to sit down with your spouse and be able to talk about things that are painful, things that are real, things that, that, that are, are in that, that is so strong, strong and beautiful. It's not weak and, and it doesn't show that we have a, a weak marriage. It shows that we have a strong marriage when we can talk to our spouse, if we see things wrong with our children, whatever it may be, if something's wrong, let's decide to speak up about it. He told Eli, I told him I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about, and he failed to restrain them. Today, let's learn a life lesson from this. Let's learn the lesson that if we know something's wrong, let's speak up. Let's say something. Let's don't stand by passively and let evil get a greater stronghold because we won't speak up. Well, I told you we're going to look at a couple dads today. Uh, the next one that I want to look at is a, a, a guy, you're, a man you're familiar with, David. A man after God's own heart. And, you know, one of the things that is shown here, illustrated by these two examples, is you can be, David was a man after God's own heart. He was a terrible dad to Absalom. Terrible. Eli was a righteous man. But he did, that does not guarantee that his sons were going to behave the way they should have. And they didn't. But David and his son Absalom, they're in a situation that is, uh, that, that's very interesting. Because one of the things that happens, and again, this story is, this story would make one of the most dramatic Hollywood movies ever. The reality of what, what went down with David and Absalom and, and his half-brother. And it's just an, it's a, an incredible, incredible story. But Absalom, you remember, you might have learned a few things about him. Uh, he had long hair. You remember that? He'd get his hair cut once a year, weighed five pounds. He would regrow, did that every year. Uh, the Bible said that from the, the top of his head to the sole of his foot, there were no defects in him. He was handsome. He was popular. But he was exiled from the kingdom. And he wanted to come back. David had to send him out of the kingdom because he had murdered his half-brother. 
And so David expels him from the kingdom, and Absalom wants to come back. And so he's pleading to come back. He's getting people on his side. Uh, he, uh, he gets Joab, one of David's closest advisors, to go to him and plead for him, please let me come back. Well, this is where we pick up here in verse 21, 2 Samuel 14. The king said to Joab, very well, I will do it. Go bring the young man Absalom. Joab fell with his face to the ground to pay him honor, and he blessed the king. Joab said, Today your servant knows that he has found favor in your eyes, my lord the king, because the king has granted his servant's request. Then Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. And then it says, The king said he must go to his own house, he must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. So, here's what happens. Absalom comes back. He never has any discussion with David. For two years he's there, and they have not reconciled their relationship. They have not sat down and talked. At the end of two years, Absalom is getting ticked off. And he tells Joab, come here, I want to go see my father. And Joab doesn't pay him any attention. And you know what? Absalom then burns a field of crops that belongs to Joab to get his attention. So Joab finally comes and he says, I want you to go to my father and I want to see my father. And so Joab goes and he pleads and Absalom, he goes and gets to see David. But all that we are told is that he came in and bowed down before his father and his father kissed him. End of story. No discussion. And so, during the next two years, Absalom spent that time building a rebellion against his father that would unseat him from his throne. It would throw the nation of Israel into total chaos. And the point of this is, I'd call this point, have the conversation. That's what I have the conversation. If we don't have conversations, Satan works to help divide and destroy everything in our lives. And as we think about these life lessons, the first thing I want to say is have a conversation with God. Sometimes we're afraid to speak honestly with God. Some of us, we have hurts in our lives. We have pain in our lives, in our hearts. And, and, and some, for some reason, we, we have been programmed to believe that a good Christian doesn't really express their frustration and anger toward or, or talk with God about their feelings. Read the book of Psalms. Read the book of Job. This is, about, this is about men who poured their hearts out to God. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And sometimes we don't have life in our spiritual walk with the Lord. It's because we're just trying to be a plastic Christian and we do not have the discussion with God that we need to have. Now, if you're here today and you're not a believer in God, the first discussion that I would encourage you to have is this. God, I don't know if you're there, but if you're there, I want to find you. That's a great first discussion to have. Some of us, we have been through many trials in our lives, and we've taken all of this hurt and pain on board, and somehow we just are not talking to God and sharing with Him what, what our frustrations are and, and, and what our needs are and, and just pouring our heart out. Have that conversation. Don't be a plastic Christian. Don't, don't, don't try to have a religianity. There's enough of that in America. Be real. Have a conversation with God. He'll speak back through his word. He'll speak back through other people. He'll speak back in your heart. But if you don't have that conversation, all kinds of darkness can happen in our lives. Secondly, I want to encourage us to have the conversation with our families. Now, I'm not talking about speaking up if something's wrong in your family. I'm talking about harmony in our family. Real, genuine harmony. What happened is, Absalom, he comes back, and Absalom, he needed to have a discussion with David. There needed to be a show of humility. There needed to be 
a, a reuniting of them as father and son. But because they had no discussion, that it destroyed David. And as, as a father, he should have taken that initiative to have that discussion with his son. Sometimes in our families, I, I'm sure it probably doesn't happen in your family, but sometimes things get crossways in our families. I'd ask to get an amen, but I, I'd probably be dangerous. You know. But that happens, even in the best of families. Sometimes, sometimes we get our feelings profoundly hurt. Have you ever been in a situation where your feelings have been profoundly hurt by someone in your family and they don't really have a clue? But you, we, walk away thinking, oh, I can't believe they did that. I, I, know, I bet they were thinking this. I bet they were thinking that. And I'm sure they meant this. And, I'm, and, and you know what? They aren't thinking anything. It's not even on their mind. It's, it's me that has taken on board something that was never intended for ill. Now, sometimes we're in families where people say things that are intended for ill. But when that's the case, a discussion, talk it out. Sometimes people say, oh, it's okay, I'll get over it. You know what happens? They never get over it. That's a lie. You don't get over it. People say, oh, it was no big deal. I'm sure this and I'm sure that. If that's really how you feel, okay, great. But a lot of times we just say that because we don't want to have the conversation. It's easier to say, oh, well, I'll just handle it, rather than go and sit and talk to someone, even in our own family. And sometimes our own family is the most challenging place to have these discussions. But have the conversation. Talk to God. Converse with him. Talk to your family. Let's, let's get beyond sports and beyond weather and beyond whatever. Let's be real with one another. Let's talk about our fears. Let's talk about our challenges. Let's talk about how we can support one another better. Uh, you know, this is what makes life real. This is what gives life energy. And we know if we'll have this conversation that God will bless it. And uh, the final area I want us to have a conversation in today is with our church family. Just like in a regular family, a spiritual family can be challenging. Now, I'm going to ask, can I get an amen on that? Thank you. It can be. We can be in challenging situations. And, and, and we need a strong dose of humility to be able to have conversations with each other, be willing to listen, quick to apologize, slow to speak, and, because we don't want Satan to get in and divide. And so... We should, as we grow in our walk with God, we should be in a mindset to have a conversation if something happens. Again, it may be purposefully and it may even not be purposefully. But if we're in that situation, let's have the conversation. Let's don't let it linger. Let's, let's have it. Let's, let's have a good Christian conversation and let's respect one another and let's go on. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. Sometimes it's just getting through those first, those first couple of sentences, you know, just getting there to, to get the conversation going. But, but you got to start, uh, you know, um, and that's, that I think is something God will bless us if we will have the conversation. Don't be like David and just put things off. Satan has a field day when we just put things off and we know that there's been hurt. As a final consideration, I want us to think about the parable of the prodigal son. We're not going to read it today. Uh, Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. I, I'm sure you're familiar with this. But I just want to, as Jesus told this parable, as I was thinking about this, I re was reflecting on this idea that here is a father that has two sons. One of them is in rebellion. One of those sons has taken off. And when he comes back, you know what happens? They have a discussion. The father talks to his son. The son comes back with a penitent attitude. And they have a discussion and they are reconciled. Now, remember the, the other part of this story? The older brother, the self-righteous, self-focused person who is out there 
fuming that his younger brother is getting a party. You remember what happened? The father went to that older brother and talked to him. Son, you've been here with me the whole time. Your brother's been gone. He's come back. I, 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 you're here. So there was this effort made to be sure that within that family, the right things happened. And so when we think about our own lives, and sometimes we think, boy, you know, I feel like I've hit this plateau in, in my Christian life. You know, I think it's, we can take an inventory and, and ask. These are, these are two questions that we can ask. Am I seeing wrong and not speaking up? God will bless one voice that will, will speak and stand for truth. And secondly, am I having those conversations? Am I willing to venture in? Why? Because I love my family. I want to be close. I love my wife. I want to be close. That's why. Not because I'm trying to start a discussion to show that I'm right. If that's why we start a discussion, you might as well not even start. Because pride stinks. And you can smell it a mile away. But in humility to have the conversations that we know that God wants us to have. And if we do that, I believe that we can learn these everyday lessons from fatherhood. We've looked at two fathers that were very deficient today, but God used them in spite of their deficiencies. And the good news is God can use us as well. And we're going to stand and sing a song of decision, a song of invitation. And today as we stand and sing... If you have a special need to uh, make a profession of faith, to ask for prayers of the church, we want to ask you to do that as we stand together and sing.